Okay, welcome everyone to my continuation of what are my favorite theorems, my very biased collection, of course. Today I would like to talk about a sphere packing or um, more appropriately, maybe bowl packing. We'll see what that actually means. And it's kind of this idea that um, we are looking for the analog of, well, bees like to build their honeycombs, right? Um, and they're really, really efficient. And there's a good reason why they're efficient. So the hexagon is a really, really crucial polygon in kind of plane geometry. And well, we don't want to use hexagons. We want to use spheres, hence the name sphere packing. And kind of look for the same properties to have a very, very dense uh, packing in three space or four space or five space or n space in general. So let me just try um, to start and motivate the problem. So here's the problem. I will run Mathematica in a second. But basically what you should think is that you have some region and my region in a second will be R to the N or R3 or R whatever. Um, in this picture, it's like this little box here. It's a, it's a box, right? So whoop, you all know how a box looks like. Um, that's a very bad box, but you know how, but this is a really, really bad box, uh, but you know how a box looks like and you would like to fill it with spheres. And actually, you will see that in some of the pictures that I have on the following slides. Actually, we want to fill them with balls, not with spheres. So the difference between a sphere and a ball is that one is hollow and the other one isn't. So um, a ball is like a cannonball. It's really, really heavy and filled and has volume. And the sphere is uh, kind of the surface of the ball. But anyway, it's called sphere packing. I shouldn't complain. And I will go with the name sphere packing, but ball packing would be more appropriate. So you would like to fill whatever kind of, what I like in this case here, the box or RN or whatever, you want to fill it with spheres such that um, yeah, you fill the most space. So you have the highest density of spheres within space. That's kind of the problem. Um, and it's not so, not so easy and it kind of depends on, um, it's really, really hard actually, and really depends on the type of, things you would like to fill your space with and also on the space. So let me just run Mathematica. So here's a Mathematica demonstration. It's of course linked in the description. And there are different ways of filling. Well, they have various names and if you click on them, they, they vary a little bit. So here is this one here. And uh, up here, you can see how kind of dense the filling is of the corresponding box at the outside. I can also turn it a little bit to so SC and face centered FCC, that's a little bit different as you can see, um, and it kind of varies a little bit. So um, more like a hexagonal packing, so more like a hexagon here. So those are kind of the packings. And as you can see, um, the box is a little bit small for this packing. So this is not really a dense packing, so you can't do this. So we assume here that all spheres have a fixed radius. And of course, then we can just assume that they have radius one. And it, well, it depends really on the box. So if you vary the dimension of the box a little bit, as you can see, it actually might, um, it's a little bit slowish. It really could change here. And as you can see, those numbers here will change. So it really depends not just on the type of um, objects you would like to fill space with, we'll show you hexagons in a second, but also uh, kind of what type of space you would like to fill. I hope the problem is now reasonably clear. So a uh, pretty simple question, a very, very innocent question. So you would like to fill a certain type of space and maybe the easiest one to start with would be just the whole space itself. So you just want to fill whatever R2, R3. So our world here, you would like to fill it with spheres of the same radius. And you ask the question, what is the, well, den the filling with, with uh, highest density? So um, we've seen different types of arranging the spheres in the demonstration already, and you would like to find the one that is the densest, right? Uh, sounds like a very innocent question, and it really sounds like there should be a nice solution. In particular, if you start trying um, the two-dimensional case. So the two-dimensional case, really the answer is the hexagonal filling, the one that bees do. Well, maybe strictly speaking, the bee setup is a little bit more like a, like a, a six gun like a hexagon. And hexagons, of course, you can use them to fill space really, really efficiently with density 100%, right? So you could really fill the whole space. But we are asking a slightly different question. You would like to fill it um, with spheres. And the way to do it is kind of to, 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 uh, to make it like this. 
well, this is a really bad drawing, but <laughs> they should touch. Uh, so to kind of arrange the spheres along the hexagon as in the picture in the middle, as in this picture here, and then you kind of can fill space pretty, pretty efficiently. So um, in this filling, you fill about 90% of space. 90% of space will be occupied by your spheres. Or as I said before, by, by your bowls, actually. 90% <laughs> of space will be occupied by your bowls. Anyway, I will stay with spheres here, um, which is pretty good. And the point is, of course, kind of to prove that there is no other kind of random arrangement, if you want, of spheres that do does a better job, right? There could be some principle, there could be some crazy random arrangement of spheres, whatever, how it looks like, it does actually a better job. Um, but in this case, it's not so hard to show that this is not, not the case. So with this 91% or whatever it is, roughly, um, this is as good as it gets, right? So you can fill 91% of space and the filling that does the job is the one that kind of bees use. Uh, so the hexa hexagon, as I said, the hexagon is kind of the main polygon or one of the most important polygons in the plain case here. And of course, our space here is a plain space, so it's R2. It's very nice. So this is relatively easy to prove. And then you might go on and think, mm, maybe this is a nice, nice problem. And I could think about this nice problem for a while. So next case would be R3. And in R3, you might come up with a conjecture very quickly. So it's called Kepler's conjecture. So this left hand side is stolen from um, Kepler's, uh, Kepler's original paper. Although I must admit, <laughs> at Kepler's time, people weren't writing research papers, they were writing books. So I think it's stolen from a book of Kepler. And Kepler kind of makes this conjecture that the cannonball is stacking. So now um, it's balls, right? So it's the, the spheres in three space would be the cannonballs. And I would like to fill all of our world with cannonballs. And um, Kepler conjectures that this face centered cannonball stacking that you can see on the right hand side here. That all of us are very familiar with, is the most efficient one. Certainly it is efficient, so that's not so hard to see. So in this case, it, it drops quite a bit. So it's only around 70%, 75% of space that is filled. Uh, so co co in contrast to the 90% uh, before, or 91, whatever it was. Um, but it's still quite very efficient. And people use it all the time, not just with Kellen balls. Maybe I've seen stacked oranges or something. Uh, so this is kind of what Kepler conjectured, and it took quite a, it's really hard to prove this. And the problem are those random arrangements. You could think of, okay, sure, this works pretty well. You can come up with this strategy pretty fast, and you've seen this before. So yeah, you would conjecture that this might be the best one. Um, but to rule out the random arrangements, like a random stacking of those balls, like a random arrangement of cannonballs, it actually does a better job. That's not so easy. And it's, it's really not so easy to see. And one of the main problems is that, well, first of all, um, there might not be a unique one that does it. So here are actually two. So there's also a hexagonal one, which is not illustrated in the pictures, but, but which was illustrated in, uh, in the Mathematica demonstration. So if you want to go back and find the hexagonal packing, you can do that. That's, that's very nice about videos, but you can just go back and ignore what I'm going to say anyway. Well, you can ignore what I'm going to say in any case, not, not, not even for uh, when you're watching this video. But anyway, so the point is, there's not a unique solution. And even if you find one that looks very good, there might still be this option that there's some really, really crazy arrangement that it's really, really even hard to imagine or almost impossible to imagine, which still does a better job. So this is extremely hard to prove and it took a long, long time to prove. So if you Google Kepler's conjecture, there's a lot of resources about Kepler's conjecture. It was really a breakthrough when it was proven uh, not very long ago, actually. So compared to Kepler, which was quite a, quite a while ago. So what can we say about this problem? So if you already get stuck in dimension three, you might think, hmm, there's absolutely nothing I can say. So what can I say about dimension four, five, six, seven, eight, whatever, 24? Um, maybe nothing. But it turns out that we can actually say at least a little bit, and this is the theorem for today. So the, the solution to the sphere packing problem is known not in many dimensions. I must admit, most of them are very, very low dimensional, but there were some really, really recent breakthroughs, 2016, 2015-ish, um, which proved it in dimensions eight and 24, which is, sounds really random. I will comment on dimensions eight and 24 in a second. But we know it from the bees in dimension 
two, uh, so dimension one, I leave it to you. Dimension one is, is lots of very interesting. Um, and we know it by Kepler's conjecture, which was really hard to prove, as I said, in dimension three, and we kind of know it in those dimensions. And I haven't really checked the latest literature, but at one point it just will break down. So we only really know it for, for low dimensions. And the problem is, as you can see this in this little table down here, um, and also in my folk conjecture, or in the folk conjecture, whatever, is that as soon as you restrict to a lattice, so a nice lattice like, like R2, uh, Z2, so Z2 lattice would be this one. Um, you can imagine a Z3 lattice, which is just uh, the same thing in three dimensions. So you have certain sp space points, and you assume that the spheres need to be centered around those uh, lattice points. You could still vary the lattice, but, not, but the spheres are kind of bound to the lattice. Then this is actually really relatively easy to prove. So it makes my, my life much easier and quite a bit is known. So the various dimensions are given by various versions of Dugan diagrams. If you have seen this, for example, in uh, type S. Here it's the E8 and there's this fa fa famous lattice in dimension 24, which is just ridiculous. Uh, it's just a miracle that it exists, which is called the leech lattice. But as soon as you release this very, very rigid setup of uh, putting my, my middle midpoints of my spheres on the lattice points, it is really, really hard to prove and not really much is known. And kind of the conjecture, the folk conjecture, which makes this whole problem so complicated is that as soon as you gain and go in high enough dimensions, then probably the lattice packing, which is the one you can easy prove. So the most efficient lattice packing is easy to find um, in contrast to the most efficient packing, which could be kind of a random arrangement. Um, this is really hard to find. And in higher dimensions, it's most likely that the uh, most dense packing is actually kind of a random packing. And we are just extremely lucky in dimensions uh, 8 and 24, and also in the low dimensions, that actually uh, the densest packings, so the general packings with random points, are lattice packings. And that's what happens here. And that's why you see those, um, those lattices, which are, which are known to be extremely efficient, and they are really one of these uh, miraculous objects in mathematics that just pop out out of nowhere and then they're most efficient in a certain sense. It's not much different from hexagon. It's just a, well, the hexagon is also very miraculous, just does the job. It's just a higher dimension version if you want. And it's kind of hard to think about it. And it's way more surprising if you see a 24 dimensional version of the hexagon, which doesn't really look like hexagon anymore. It's, it's really different, but still it's, it does, kind of does the same job. If you Anyway, um, so what I'm going to explain last, so this was a theorem. I would like to highlight a little bit uh, those E8 and the leech lattice. So um, certainly I should do a different video on those. So they're really, really interesting. And it was roughly around the same time, as I said, when people proved that it's really, really recent for mathematics, it's 2016. And they really give the densest packing by just stacking the spheres on the lattice. So the midpoints on the spheres on the lattice. And while not going too much into details here, they are really, really important objects. Kind of, they kind of pop up randomly in some sense in mathematics, which I'm going to explain in a different video. Uh, for now, just for example, that people actually built a projection of E8 out of, out of I think it's court or something. Um, anyway, link is in the description. And um, if you would like to think of it as a certain object in eight space, so this is an eight dimensional object, it's not so easy to think of, I just uh, copied the matrix here. So it's it's a lattice. So the, the, the Z times points spent by the vectors, by the, uh, what is it? The column vectors in this matrix. So that's actually the lattice. And if you look at the entries, it's absolutely not clear why this should be in any way a nice lattice. But honestly, if you look at the, whatever, the uh, end points of a hexagon in coordinates, it's also not quite clear why the hexagon should be a good object to study. Um, it's kind of the same here. So it's a little bit miraculous what happens to those um, E8 lattice and the uh, leech lattice, and I should go into more details. But the point here is that in dimensions 8 and 24, we are still kind of lucky. This is kind of the, the uh, law of small numbers. We are very lucky here. And the densest packing is not random. It's one of those lattice packings. And it's uh, well, with, faith, with the midpoint centered on those E8 or leech lattice 
whatever it is, depends on whether it's uh, dimension eight or dimension 24. Anyway, so let me wrap up. So the theorem here about sphere packings, which I think doesn't have any nice name. Let me just call it the sphere packing theorem is um, to find the uh, densest packing in your favorite dimension and just pack the whole space. Just packing a specific um, whatever box or something is a much more complicated problem actually. So um, just let's stay with the space. And it's only known in very small dimensions. And the kind of the point is, the reason why it's only known in small dimensions is because we are super lucky. And in this case, kind of there is no random packing if you want, or no really efficient random packing. Of course, there is a random packing, um, which is better than uh, packing on a lattice. And the lattice packings are just easy in some sense to find. And they're usually related to very important structures in mathematics like the lattice is coming from the Duncan diagrams or the Leach lattice. In any case, I hope you enjoy lattices. I mean, I hope you enjoyed this video and I also hope to see you next time.